Do you know who was the most popular Victorian author simultaneously in Great Britain and the United States? The answer is Charles Dickens. He was such a popular figure in America that crowds were overwhelmed to hear his novels read by Dickens, while the popular public readings I am talking about. I am giving you a link to the BBC article in the description, you can read them. Now, why I am talking about this popular news? What I am saying is that even though Dickens was popular, he was also not beyond criticism. In fact, he has earned criticism and some of those criticism are the gravest literary and some of those criticism are the gravest from a literary point of view. No doubt Dickens was truly a gifted humorist and critic of the social evils of his time, the Victorian time. Charles Dickens is a good storyteller. His stories are gripping in their interest. Critics after critics have recognized the genius of Dickens. They have also emphasized his many glaring social criticism. However, critics have mentioned time and again several weaknesses in Dickens' plot construction and design such as superfluity, verbosity, incoherence, lack of unity, improbability, abuse of coincidence, overcrowding of events, lack of logical relationship between the plot and the characters, subordination of plot and characters, overmoralizing and there are many such accusations. It is also true that his characters are frequently eccentric, almost caricatures. They change very little or not at all in the course of the narrative, but they are nonetheless memorable. Now the point of argument it comes, why such is the disbalance, the popularity and the criticism. Hello friends. I am Ardhendu De and you are watching Edis English Literature. In this video lecture, I am going to discuss 10 points of criticism on Charles Dickens writing style. Now the 10 points of criticism of Charles Dickens writing style, it is often accused that Dickens novels suffer from these 10 diseases elements, literary elements, the limited characterizations, falsifies reality by so many of the imaginative articulation, incoherent plot structure, morality, often is difficult art, no sex in his novels, absence of any prominent point of view, lack of invention, no proper ending and misuse of coincidence and superfluity. Now we will try to analyze these 10 points one by one. We will try to get the answer if it is true or not or we will at least try to decipher the 10 points and try to locate the definite argument that the critics are making. In our discussion, we will quote many critics in this regard, uh, references from references from uh, Aliguias and Kajamiam, A History of English Literature, W. Allen's Six Great Novelists and J.K. Chesterton's Appreciation and Criticism of the Works of Charles Dickens 
and David Cecil, the early Victorian novelists. But before we start discussing the topic, let's focus on Charles Dickens' life and works first. Dickens was born in 1812. His father, John Dickens, was a Navy pay clerk and his mother, Catherine Dickens, was housewife. Neither of his parents was particularly matured in financial matters and in 1824, John Dickens was thrown into the Marcel C. prison for debt. Now these are the very turning point of Charles, Diff Charles Dickens' build-up. Charles had been taken out of the school a year ago and sent to work in Warren's blacking factory. This was the most traumatic event in Dickens' young life. After his father's uh, release from the prison, Dickens returned to school briefly, but his formal education was ruined. When he was 15, everything was stopped. Now, a succession of jobs followed, including solicitor's clerk, a shorthand reporter, a parliamentary reporter. He began contributing stories to newspapers, magazines, novel serializations, and editorial jobs. All these things, all, the, all these processes, the artist Charles Dickens was born. His notable books that we are proud of reading are Sketches by Bodge, Oliver Twist, Pickwick Papers, Nicholas Nickelway, The Old Curiosity Shop, Barnaby Ridge, American Notes, Martin Chulchwit, A Christmas Carol, Dombe and Son, David Copperfield, Bleak House, and there is Hard Times, Little Dorrit, which was published in 1855, Household Words, All the Year Round, and so many of the notable novels you can read, The Tale of Two Cities, that's fantastic one, The Great Expectation, uh, which is a a kind of autobiographical our mutual friend and all those books all those publications made Charles Dickens a public popular star public star and his fame reached throughout the corner of the world no doubt Dickens is a good storyteller his stories are gripping in their interest. He is able to give us a very good kind of entertainment. He fills the gaps by good scenery and immortal characters. For him, characters are more important than their manners or situations. But his range of characterization is extremely limited. And here the critics accuse us that most of his characters belong to lower middle classes or lower classes of London. Characters belonging to the aristocracy or intellectual or complex characters are simply beyond his range. They are missing. He cannot draw a true London gentleman. But his worst fault is that he does not recognize his range and often goes beyond it and thus creates a kind of a theoretical lifeless abstractions. And that is the accusation mostly comes from the critics. Moreover, he is taken up with the externals of his characters and does not prove the inner depths. So he always have a depiction of the characters from the surface reality, not to the inner reality. The psyche, the inner depth or the core of the heart is missing in his characters. So the 
most of the characters in him remain flat, one-sided, like the dummies of the melodrama. They are distinguishable into monsters of vices and virtues rather than remain human beings compounded by human traits. They have some particular traits, exaggerated proportion in that degree. And that traits has been highlighted time and again, time and again throughout the, and that's the kind of a tedious one. They have some tag, level or catchphrases attached to every kind of characters. They are kind of a characterization which is familiar to that inferior kind of drama. They often act out, suffer from continual repetition and exaggeration. And that kind of characterization ruined most of the characters of his novels. If we don't find any development of characters in Dickens novels, David Goparfield and Great Expectation are real exceptions. Take for example another, Hard Times. Here Bounder Bay marries the reluctant Louisa and neither of them changes in the slightest degree. Bounder Bay does not in the least softens. His habits do not undergo the least alteration even under the influence of his wife. As for the wife, she remains cold and proud and never utters a single word of protest to her husband. These characters looks like rubber stamp. And Louisa remains throughout the novel the same disdainful creature that she appears at the beginning of the story. Now, these are really exception in the case of Great Expectation and Oliver Twist, where more of the characters are forward. In George H. Ford, the uniqueness of Dickens are the successful creations in the apparent in their speech. He is really flat characters. His insipid heroes and heroines, in many instances, they have no distinctive style. They are mere types. They are more ordinary, more natural, hence should supposedly be more probable. Instead, they are mechanical and lifeless. Now, in Dickens' characters, in a world of highly stylized and strongly colored individual, they are pale and insignificant and paradoxically improbable. A second aspect of Dickens' method is the use of comic exuberance. He was aware of this, that these two can lead to improbabilities. So his characterization sometimes leads to the close of improbability. But that sort of improbability has been saved somewhere. But in the most of the cases, it is saved by his ideas, robust ideologies. As Ligonius and Kajamian point out, his imagination is essentially aesthetic. And so he often distorts or falsifies reality to create picturesque emotional effect. That's notable geniusness in Dickens, but at once it is also ruining the very mirth of novel writing. Particular traits of his characters sometimes are exaggerated, in the most of the time exaggerated, much so that they look like caricatures. It is also in this way that his plot is often overdone and becomes mockery and sentimental. It is for this reason too. Though his novels have many realistic touches somewhere, they sometimes give the impressions of reality sometimes, but most of the times the reality is marred by overpunching of 
imagination the fantastic imagination has both the weakness as well as the source of strength it enables him to search for beauty in ugliness but it also leads to gross exaggeration and ruining of the plot Dickens plots are generally speaking weak and incoherent the plot has no sense of form his plots are like shapeless bags in which a novelist pours all sort of characters and events there is much is superfluous much that is unnatural and quite impossible there is often natural flotation often there is abuse of coincidence too many ends are left loose and hanging till the very last chapter sometimes they are tied together in haste and at other times quite a few of them are not tied at all but not all of the novels get expectations or hard times are real exceptions hard times is a wonderfully compact novel it is free from digression unnecessary details or too much moralization the novel's brevity allows no room for irrelevant matters as george sampson points out the pamphleters and moralist in dickens often pushes out the artist he was a novelist with a purpose his was a fight against oppression and injustice and his reforming zeal often comes in the way of an artist many of dickens exaggerations are prompted by his reforming enthusiasm besides this he often introduces into his stories an element of superfluity with his sentimental comment and views the story waits as dickens moralizes and the readers get bored and annoyed moreover in the end the vice must be punished and the virtue rewarded the conclusions of his novels for this reason are often artificial unnatural and sometimes fantastic dickens has been criticized on the other counts as well there is no sex in his novels sex is an important part of life but it is completely missing from the novels of dickens there is no psychological insight or the psychological interpretation of the whole run of human living there is no psychological analysis of sexual problems and there are no sexual deviations or sexual abnormalities those abnormalities are natural abnormalities that should be portrayed by an artist but dickens has omitted them all His novels are clean not likely to bring a blast to the most innocent checks but to that extent they suffer as works of art the picture of the life they represent or the present is partial one sided dickens refuses to face fact and avoid everything which his age regarded as coarse and vulgar so he is the man of the time now going to the flight of louisa in hard time so once again which is my personal favorite novel louisa has disliked bounder bay ever since her childhood but she marries him and that marriage is a kind of a shattering of her brain when she asks her father what advice he has to give her in this matter He goes on to talk of statistics to show that cases of young girls marrying much older men are fairly common. But after the marriage, she remains faithful to Wonder Bay. Still, her house appears on the scene, and even then, 
she does not deviate from the path of wifely virtue in spite of the hard house uh, importunities i think uh, louisa's heart goes unchecked here now many of the things that louisa's heart might have experienced is not shared by dickens in these lines it has been said there is no philosophy no serious body of thought in dickens novels i say this is absolute false the absence of point of view of a considered philosophy of life accounts to a very great extent for the modern reaction against dickens his style is mannered often coarse vulgar these are the accusations at his best lacking the refinement and polish these are all accusations if we mine deep into dickens novels we can find out an underlying underlying philosophy in dickens which tells a reformist man who is living at the times and he has some definite message open there are some glaring faults of gamar it is the style of a journalist rather than of a man of letters in dickens writings such are the faults of dickens uh, these end could have been achieved by more natural means but dickens fondness for melodramatic self portrayals sometimes betrays him into the wild excesses dickens lack of invention mars even some of his best novels in david copperfield the story of emily is unhappily conceived the mystery surrounding uh, wickfield the nevaries of uya heep have no claim upon our belief intrigues are half heartedly introduced merely because intrigue seems necessary to run the plot the situation in which mr micaver brings we a heap to book is theatrical and unconvincing for example the scene between emily and rosa dartle is entirely theatrical and fails to carry conviction so all this like that of a fill in the gaps david's flight from london and the direction it takes are insufficiently accounted for there is much in his novels that is merely conventional in the tradition of filling long lost hairs mistaken identity disguised lovers artificial intrigues these are like that of copies and this copycat attitude is all for commercial purposes for for serialization of publications but but david copperfield is remarkably free from such conventional elements indeed as as what points out that double love story of the hero david's love and marriage with dora and then with agnes has been managed with great skill by dickens similarly there is a double story pattern in great expectations and these two are great successes his closing scenes are often contrived in the tradition of the theater and are brought to a happy end however forced and unnatural that happy end may appear this scene is to be seen at its worst in martin chekhovit which has been written just he returned from america after his first visit where the family of emigrant from america turns up at the right moment to fill the cup of benevolence and rejoicing in great expectation pip is not left a lonely man in the interest of a happy ending there is always poetic justice at the end the wicked are punished the victorious are and the virtuous are victorious 
suitably rewarded. Examples may be drawn from David Copperfield. Uriya Heap is punished. Mr. McEwer prospers in Australia and David is happily married to Agnes. Thus, Dickens' moral purpose makes his closing scene often unnatural and improbable. They are dragged into conclusion. But why so? I would make an explanation of this type of attitudes in the conclusion. This fault, most palpable, most gross, which Dickens everywhere commits, is the abuse of coincidence. In David Copperfield, for example, Steerforth returns to England from his travels with Emily. His ship is wrecked at Yarmouth, and his dead body is washed up at the feet of David, who happened to have made a little journey to see his Yarmouth friend on that very day. It is forced. It is again a coincidence that Miss Mudstone happens to be the companion of Dora. The plot of Bleak House is held together by the abuse of coincidence in its most flagrant form. In Dickens' novels, things happen when and where the novelist wants them to happen. Or is it the compulsion of the readers in a serialized magazine? The misuse of coincidence makes his plots artificial and unnatural. Dickens' narration frequently suffers from much tedious superfluity. Frequently he opens a chapter with a long passage of old moralizing facts which has nothing to do with the story. In Martin Lewitt, there is a long, long chapter directed against an adventure of high which is entirely superfluous. And the story would gain much by its missing. In David Copperfield, the story is told in the first person. David relates in detail conversations which took place before his birth, a plot which therefore could not have been heard by him. Thus, similitude is violated. The natural question which the reader asks is why David came to know all that happened before his birth. However, Parsimilitude has been preserved with remarkable care in great expectations, which too is narrated in the first person. The various faults we have noted above may be accounted in a number of ways. Much that is conventional in his plots result from fondness for the theatre and the picture tradition. So all the criticism of things that we have here boarded are not nailed. Dickens often wrote for the first time and the rapidity of production forced upon him by the serial method of the production tended to looseness of the construction that we often find in the TV serials. Marks of haste, lack of revision are writ large on his novels. There was further his intellectual inability to see his work as a whole. The serial method of publication had this further disadvantage that he could not see mentally the whole of the work on which he was engaged and could not make alteration in the earlier chapters even when he considered much alteration necessary. Beside this, he cared more for character than for plot or coincidence or incidents. He strained his plot to the utmost to accommodate his characters. So one thing is superfluously dragged on. That is the storyline. And within this, the characters are fit, but they remain unfit. 
we may conclude this account of Dickens' plot with the words of David Cecil. Dickens may not construct the story well, but he tells it admirably. With the first sentence, he grips the attention of the readers and does not let it go till the very end. His scenery is always charming. Dialogue admirable, incidents thrilling, exciting. There is often overabundance of wit and humor to delight, to entertain. Besides, as both a C. Ward and Baker agree, David Copperfield is remarkably free from such usual faults of Dickens. It is not a mere string of adventures and experiences, but as a well marked theme, the story moves forward more rapidly, smoothly. Than in the case of other novels, there is much less of melodrama. There is less or uh, direct moralizing. So these things happens time and again in other novels too. But but we have to remember that Charles Dickens had been the product of a time, a Victorian time, a Victorian time had some faults. The improbability, the coincidence, the melodramatic tendencies and the too much burden of moralizations were the product of the time and Dickens has just followed the time. Even some of his novels may be overcrowded. Now overcrowding is necessary even to make a plot, make a, a theme of the moralizations of the time. Uh, necessary for Dickens and that's why more of the characters he dragged some are useless sometimes but he somehow borrowed them to make a panoramic view of the Victorian world he failed somewhere but his purpose was genuine so with that hope that you have to understand the different accusations of the critics and their uh, arguments against the Dickens style and Dickens writing and the so-called defense that I have made in somewhere is a argumentative essay or argumentative discussions that I have carried forward that I have uh, mentioned here so uh, you can listen these lectures you can comment here you can make arg arguably other points and counterpoints so that uh, that study continues on Charles Dickens but before I signing up to you I like to make a request that if you are reading Charles Dickens just make three or four novels uh, reading uh, a part of your studies particularly David Copperfield the great expectation hard times these three are must for your further understanding of his style, of his venture, and even to make a proper understanding of the Victorian novel writing, you must take these novels by heart. Like, share, comment, and obviously subscribe to my channel. And if you have any suggestions, you can make here in the comment box. Bye-bye. Thank you.